Brought your Bible back tonight. Amen. We're going to need it. Let's go back to um, where we started last night. That's sort of the theme verse of this week would be Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah 33. And uh, let's look in verse 5 and 6. The Lord is exalted, for He dwelleth on high. He hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. Zion is the mountain of God. It's the city of God, the house of God. It is Zion is where the presence of God is. And since we have God's Spirit dwelling in us, we have God's Word with us every day, then Zion is, is you. It's in you. He hath filled Zion with judgment and with righteousness. And then verse 6, Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times, and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is His treasure. Now, we're concentrating on this idea of knowledge. I believe knowledge is the key for the times that we're living in right now. The Bible said that in these last days, knowledge shall be increased. And what we're learning about the universe, what we're learning about the world around us, what we're learning about the heavens, what we're learning about the earth, what we're learning about the human body and how it works. I'm just, I'm not a genius at this. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a mathematician. I'm not anything like that. I just have a, an inquisitive mind. There's things I want to know. I sat down one day, literally one day, and uh, there's another verse. In fact, go to, uh, that's Isaiah 33. Go to Jeremiah 33. Jeremiah 33. These 33 things I like. In fact, I'll make an illustration here in just a little bit. Jeremiah 33, 3, the Bible says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. So, I, if whatever it is that you don't know, you ask God. I love peanut butter. Amen. The guy that invented peanut butter... What was his name? George Washington Carver. A former slave, went to, went to, educated himself, went to university, testified before Congress because he had, I don't know how many inventions that he had made from just the peanut, including dairy milk. He learned how to make milk from a peanut. And they asked him, he testified before Congress, how is it that you came about to make milk out of a peanut? And he said, I just asked the Lord one day, Lord, show me how to make milk out of a peanut. And he said, the Lord showed me how to make milk out of a peanut. Of course, I didn't sit too well Congress, you know, but anyway, it was the truth. Whatever it is that you don't know, you have a father who does. Amen. As you may have gone to your earthly father, your earthly mother, asked them how to do this, asked them how to do that, or they may, they may have taken you aside whether you wanted to know it or not and showed you how to do different things. My dad showed me how to split wood. I did not want to learn how to split wood, but my daddy showed me how to split wood. So I can split wood. But my father teaches me these things. So I sat down one day and we was going to, I was going to do a teaching in our church. We was going to have our homecoming. We had families come in from all over the country, and, uh, including Canada. And they come down, and I said, Lord, I don't know anything about the human blood. Would you show me? Because I believe there's something special about our blood. God, would you show me about our blood? And in one day, God gave me a presentation on human blood. If you've not, who has seen that? What I've talked about on blood. A couple of you. I've got, is that DVD out here? I hope it is. If it's not, I'm going to give my girls a whipping when I get back for not getting the right DVDs out. But anyway, there's a deal that I do on blood. And I'm, I'm going to try to show you some of that tonight. I'm going to teach you about your body. Last night it was know your Bible. Tonight it's know your body. Now there's a very, 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 very important reason why there are some things that we need to know about the body that God has given us. And whether you like your body the way it is or not, God gave you the body that you have. God wrote it out to be exactly the way it is. You are the way God made you, and there's no way around it. Amen? And if God made you a certain way with all your strengths and your weaknesses, God made you weak. God did not make you strong. God's strong. 
Paul had a thorn in his flesh, and he said it was a messenger of Satan that buffeted him. He was buffeted daily by this thing. And three times he asked God to take it out. God did not tell him no. God will not tell you no. Do you know that? Show me in the Bible where God ever told one of his children no. He'll either give you what you ask for, or he'll give you better than what you ask for. And I've learned over the years that things that I've prayed for have been far, I've been very, very nearsighted, not seeing the whole of what God could do. And I would ask God for things, and God wouldn't give it to me, but that wasn't God telling me no. That was God saying, I've got something far better than what you just asked me for. And I've learned that if I wait on that, God will show me what it is, and I'll go, you know what, God, that's a lot better than what I asked for. I think I'll take that one. Amen. So anyway, you know what, let's do, let's turn to, um, let's turn, you're looking at the verse up on the screen, we're going to start there. Turn to 1 Corinthians, if you would, 1 Corinthians uh, 12, and uh, we're going to talk about gifts here in a little bit. But Psalm 139, as you're turning to, um, turning to 1 Corinthians 12, Psalm 139, verse 13, this is David. Now David is saying this, David lived... Uh, he lived just before Solomon. Solomon lived about a thousand years before Jesus. Jesus has been about 2,000 years from us here. So about 3,000 years ago, here is David. And God is inspiring David to write these words down. David may or may not really have understood what he was writing. But as we are in this day and age, I look at it now and I can clearly see some things that David was writing in here. I'm not sure if he got it or not, but I get it. I'm not saying I get it all, but there's part of this that I get. For thou hast possessed my reins. What, is, what are reins? Who has horses? What do you do with reins? You use that to guide those horses. God has possessed your reins. God knows how to get you to turn left. God knows how to get you to turn right. God knows how to get you to stop. God knows how to get you to go. God knows, God knows how to move you. Amen. Thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. I wonder what he was talking about when he said that. The lowest parts of the earth. Look at verse 16. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being Unperfect. And that's all of us. We're not what we want to be. We're not what we can be. We're not what we will be one of these days. So we are unperfect. And God sees that in us. And then he said, and in thy book, all my members were written. Think about what he's saying. Every member of your body. Your arms, your hands, your feet, your skin, your liver, your eyes, your hair, your cough, your phlegm. God made phlegm, didn't he? And everything about your body, he wrote it in a book. And I have a copy of it right here. What is this? DNA. DNA. Do you know what DNA stands for? Very good. You get a free DVD off the table. <laughs> and 10 free YouTube views. <laughs> Deoxyribonucleic acid. Now, that's the double strand version of it. If it's a single strand, what is it? Smarty. RNA, RNA, ribonucleic acid. So the double strand is deoxyribonucleic, and the single strand is ribonucleic acid. And there's some differences between it, but I don't want to get into that tonight. But I want you to take a look at this, because this is how it is when the DNA is being read for something. Remember, this is a book. This is a book that God wrote. Now, when it's normally in your cells, it's, it's rolled up like this, like a scroll is rolled up. Think of this DNA 
as a scroll of a book, a roll of a book that's written. And whenever the Jewish rabbis or whenever Jesus in Luke chapter 4, when they gave him a copy of the book to read, he opened the book, meaning that he unrolled it so that it could be read. And did you know that in your body, man, I'm getting way ahead of myself. I'm not even ready for that part yet. In your body, when your body needs more phlegm, sorry, you just, you just coughed it up and I have to talk about it, all right? You brought it up, so we're going to vote on it, all right? So, but when your body needs to produce more phlegm, there is a recipe in your DNA on exactly how to make it. Now, you don't eat phlegm to make phlegm. Thank God. But what you eat, your body takes the minerals and the proteins out of it, and it takes the proteins, it reads the recipe from the DNA book, and it makes phlegm, and when it's done, it rolls it back up again just like a scroll because it doesn't need that part of that anymore, okay? There's so many wonderful testimonies that I'm going to share with you. I may just talk about DNA and nothing about DNA tonight because I love deoxyribonucleic acid. I love talking. This is God's book. God wrote it just as sure as you believe he wrote that Bible. God wrote this book. God wrote your book. Okay, so if God wrote that book, who has a right to change that book? Man doesn't. It's not man's book. Amen? All right. So look at, look at verse 16 again. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being imperfect. And in, the all, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So when you were conceived in your mother's womb, you were one little dot, one little speck, one little cell. And in that one cell was the instructions for everything that you are. You know, I saw a picture of Brother Ellis back here on the wall back here. You, you look different now. <laughs> How long ago was that? Can't remember, can you? About 44 years ago. They took pictures back then? <laughs> Ten types, okay. I, I already know that. I'm 52, so I, yeah, they took pictures back then. So 44 years ago, your DNA has changed you over the years. Huh? That's exactly what it is. See, back then, his head was all black. Right? So, huh? Your hair was all black. Okay? And you had more of it. And in his DNA, it didn't show up when he was 5, didn't show up when he was 16, didn't show up when he was 30. But in his DNA was a portion that was written out that said, at a certain point, we're going to change his hair color, and we're going to let go of some of it. Never to return again. That was all written before... In fact, I believe it was written out before the foundation of the world. God had it all figured out. Okay? So when I was in my mother's womb, I didn't have hair. I didn't have eyes. I didn't have a beating heart. I didn't have legs. I didn't have lungs. I didn't have anything like that. And as the cells multiplied and divided and multiplied and divided and multiplied and divided, at some point, some of that DNA went sideways. And instead of looking like all the other cells, it's called cell differentiation. It is why some churches worship a mile over here, and this church worships here. Now that church a mile over there, they're probably, probably they're still all going to heaven. But God has them a little bit different than he does everybody here. We can accept some differences. I've been all over the country. I've been to Kenya. And I'm telling you, there's some, you heard Brother Mike Hutzel talk about his, his experience in Kenya. I want to tell you what, it opens your eyes. There are godly people over there who love the Word of God, who've just got it in them to. See, I can't do it. I ain't got it. But they got it in them, and they worship God from their head down to their toes. And, it, I mean, it's righteous, and it's holy. But see, at some point, God wanted them different. So 1 Corinthians 12, turn there to 1 Corinthians 12. 
Let's get some wisdom from this Bible. Let's understand it. God did not make everybody an exact duplicate of everybody else. The members are different. Every member is different. Look at verse 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. The same Spirit means the same Bible. Now, I will tell you, the, the Spirit that is in you comes from the Bible that you read and believe. You believe that. Remember what Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. So when you're talking about Jesus, you're talking about the Bible. When you're talking about the Holy Spirit, you're talking about the Bible. There are, there are, these three are one. So you cannot separate them. The, and so when you get around, some of you guys know this, you get around some people that they ain't touched a King James Bible in 30 years. And they're reading every other translation like that. And there's just something, your spirit and their spirit ain't getting along. Because you start bringing up King James and they, you'll see it in their act. You'll see it in their visage. You'll see it in their countenance. Ooh, that King James. We don't have King James. You're King James only. And I want to tell you what, you don't have to move them away from you. They'll, they'll run away. Their spirit, I'm telling you, their spirit is different. But when they all have the same, listen, this is a book that God wrote. This is a book that God wrote. And God makes this DNA in my body to make me look like I am and how I am and how I, how I act and how I play the piano and how I, you know, d d tell funny, stupid jokes or whatever it is. And God made you different, but we're all from the same Adam. Adam is sitting in this church in every one of us. We're all Adam made from the dirt. Amen. So same spirit. Verse 5, and there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Now I like this because I'm one of these, I still believe the Holy Spirit gives gifts. You need wisdom? Do you need a word of wisdom? There is nothing greater than a word of wisdom from this book right here. Y'all know that, don't you? Okay. You've had preachers that preach this book and you learn something from it. Did you learn something last night? God gave you wisdom. God gave you a word of wisdom from this book. Okay. Uh, what about the, um, oh, the, word, the word of knowledge? Where does knowledge come from? Learn this Bible. Know this Bible. Don't just assume that you know the Bible. Know the Bible. Amen? What about the gift of uh, faith? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by? What about the gifts of healing? He sent His Word and healed them. Amen? His Word will heal them. To another, the working of miracles. The miracles are right here in the Bible. God works miracles through the Word of God. To another prophecy. How can I prophesy except from the Word of God? What about the discerning of spirits? If you, the Bible said test the spirits. Did He not? The way to test a spirit is if they say what this book says. And if they don't say what this book says, they're not the Spirit of God. That's how you, listen, here's the manual to test them with. Some of you guys work a job where there are specifications written down in a book somewhere. Am I telling the truth? And you've got to follow those specifications. I don't care what it is that you do. I don't care if you plow a field. I don't care if you build things. I don't care if you repair things. There are specifications for what you do in every occupation in life. And they are written down in a book somewhere. Somebody smarter than you put them in there. Or maybe some lawyers did. Just to cover some guy with a suit. Amen. But whether whoever put it there or not, you've got to follow the book. That's right. Amen. And you test things by using the specifications that have been given you by the authority that's, been, that's over you in that job. Am I telling you the truth? Amen. Listen, I hung sheetrock. I painted houses. There were specifications for everything that we did and everything in the building. If, 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 if the framers come in and build a wall... And I hang the drywall on it, and the drywall doesn't fit that wall. The stupid carpenters built the wall wrong. Because you can't stretch sheetrock, amen? 
Makes us mad. I don't want to get into all that. They didn't follow the specifications, right? If you're going to test spirits, you test them right here by this book. Amen. See, and by the way, it's a free gift. Amen. You still don't earn them, do you? You're still, you're still not good enough, are you? None of you are. You're still not good enough to earn these things. The Spirit gives them as a gift to you. And He'll give you one, and He'll give you one. Look at your eyes getting real big. And God will give, that is a nice mustache. I got to say it, that is a nice mustache. Okay? You can't walk in a room without somebody going, that's a mustache. Okay? So I'm not making fun of you, it's just, you're all, I got a guy in my church would love to see you. All right? So anyway, uh, but you got to go by the book. You're going to discern spirits? You got to go by the book. Okay? And then he said, to another, diverse kinds of tongues, to another, interpretation of tongues. You know, they speak English in Kenya, but they don't speak my English in Kenya. They don't understand my, and I keep trying to tell these Kenyans, I don't have an accent. I don't. They do. I don't. But they don't understand my accent. So when we preach over there, there's a man that interprets. And I pray over the man that interprets for me. I pray, God, give him the gift of interpretation of tongues. God will do it. By the way, this Bible, this King James Bible, is the direct result of the interpretation of tongues. Because you don't read Greek, you don't read Hebrew, you don't know those languages, and yet God translated them correctly for you in this one. Amen? You believe that? Amen. All right, now, look at verse, but well, 11, but all these worketh that one in the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one, the body is one, and hath many members. And all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Amen? Amen. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Let me explain one Spirit. You have two lungs in your body. Okay? Why two? One's Old Testament, one's New Testament. See how it's divided up? I'm going to show you something else about the lungs here in a little bit. You'll, you'll shout. You might even turn Kenyan and dance a little bit, all right? But you have two lungs in your... The head is up here. This is Christ. But where is His Spirit? It's down with the body. He left the Spirit. He sent, Jesus went up, but He sent the Spirit down here where the body is. Isn't that good? Your lungs are right here. And when I breathe in, it goes in how many holes? One, two, three. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. In Christ dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Three holes that air, air goes in. Comes in from the head, goes down to the lungs. The lungs then, the blood goes through the lungs, grabs all that oxygen, and takes it where? To every part of the body. It doesn't matter how far down the body your toes get the same spirit as your arms do, and your chest does, and your muscles, your, your shoulders do. Your t you, and some of you say, well, I'm not as close to God as other people are. But I guarantee you, when the head moves, the whole rest of the body moves in the same place. We don't leave the toes behind. Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't down yourself. Because you can't do this, or you can't get up here and sing like these young people, or you don't look good, or whatever. Don't put yourself down. Because he says in this chapter that it's not the comely parts that are the most beneficial, it's the ugly ones. And I've got a little toe on my right foot, it's about that big, and it's the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. The toe, why did God put a toenail on that thing? Right? And nobody, my wife did not say, you know, before I marry you, I want to see your toes. Because that's important to me. She didn't say that. In fact, I don't know why she did marry me. But anyway, but I'm going to tell you something. That toe, that toe causes the body to do what God called us to do. Having done all, to stand. To withstand in the evil day. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty with Christ and made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That little toe, 
That little toe, you may not think much about it, but you see, if you've, got a, you've got one of those gyroscopes in both ears. You've got gyroscopes in both ears, bubble levels in both ears, bubbles and liquid that, de- your, that send signals to your brain on which direction your body is leaning at any given time. And it's what tells your brain that you need to adjust something. And as my body is swaying around like this, it's my little toe on each foot that is pushing my body back where it needs to be. That little toe is never seen by anybody, but it is one of the most important parts of my body. You may not be the one out knocking doors. You may not be the one that's up here preaching or teaching Sunday school class or sitting on the board. But you've been here for years. You're the foundation of this church, and you always are here to help this church stand. That's good, isn't it? Don't you ever, don't you ever, there's that, don't ever deny yourself the calling and the gift that God has given you. Look at verse, uh, look at verse 14, for the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased who? Him. Him it pleased Him. And they were, and if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need. But God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which which lacked that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. That applies to a church. That applies to a a fellowship. If you're in some sort of fellowship, that applies at home to a family. No schisms in the family. And not one of the children or not one of the siblings or not one of the mom or dad is more or less important than the other. They are family. They are one. And what is the devil trying to do in these last days? Destroy. He's trying to divide. He's trying to put schisms everywhere. Amen? Don't let him do it. Don't. And look at here, verse 26. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. You know, who in here has ever had surgery? You have surgery, and they cut something out of you or fix something in you, and for weeks your whole body, you'll feel like nothing. You think, well, I'll have that surgery. I'll be back work in a couple days. And, you, and three days later, you, you walk to the kitchen door and can't even hardly breathe. Why? Because every part of your body is donating its resources to heal the wound. That's why, you, that's why when you get the flu, you can't hardly get up out of bed. That's why when you got a bad cold, you can't even hardly make it to the bathroom. You're sick. Your whole body is suffering because one member is. Ain't that how it's supposed to be in a body? Shouldn't we have care and donate for the benefit of other members in the body that are hurting and suffering? We get calls all the time. We're kind of close to the high. We're close to two highways. Highway 55 and Highway Interstate 67 is right at our back door. And we get people coming in all the time wanting help. And I don't mind helping them, but Bethel people come first. And whatever it is they need, we get it for them. Whatever, they, whatever, whatever suffering they're going through, we're there for them. That's how you're supposed to be. Amen? Amen. Now you're the body of Christ and members in particular. And God has set some of the church first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles and gifts of healings, helps. This, this is what I'm doing here. I'm a help. I'm not your apostle. I'm not your pope or your bishop. I'm a help. 
Okay? I'm helping you read the Bible, helping you, getting you excited about what's in your Bible. So you, how many of you went home and read your Bible last night? Wasn't it neat? Okay? Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Have all gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? No. But covet honestly, earnestly the best gifts, and yet I've shown you a more excellent way. And then 1 Corinthians 13 is about, is about charity. All right? Now, uh, let's go back here to this body. Boy, that was good. All right, now we're going to get to the 1030 episode. All right? No, I'm just, I'm having fun tonight. Okay? I don't care if I stick with my notes, as long as we stick with the Word. So, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in that book all my members were written, which in continuous for fashion, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. You know what God does in heaven? He sits and He thinks about you. You ever thought about how many people are praying at one time to the same God? And God is hearing every one of their prayers. And God, is, God knows about everything that's going on in their mind. God's reading their thoughts. God, and here's Jesus being the, being the mediator between all of us people and God. And He's got the ability to take all the prayers of all the saints all at one time and share them with His Father. And God has the ability to answer all those prayers in His perfect time. I'll tell you what, God thinks about you. Amen. Amen. Know your body. Your body is a temple. Now I'm going to show you, I, I, I went for years thinking of the metaphor of that, of that saying, your body is a temple. And I think, well, that's a great symbol, that's a metaphor, but it's not real. I was, I, I'm telling you something. If I'm wrong on this, I'll, I'll probably have to get out of the ministry. Your body is more the temple of God than the one Solomon built. Than the one Moses put together. Than Herod's temple. Your body is the temple of God. I'm, I'm going to prove it to you. John chapter 2 verse 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building. Isn't that interesting? He said forty and six years. Why did he say forty and six years? And wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. You see, the temple that was Herod's temple, you know what it didn't have in it? Didn't have candlestick. Didn't have the seven candlesticks in it. You know what else it didn't have? Didn't have the table of showbread in it. You know what else it didn't have? The Ark of the Covenant. And they found that out when the curtain was split in half. That was showing that the entrance to God was made open to everybody. And for the first time, they're looking in back there and they're going, there's no Ark of the Covenant in there. God was not in that building. The real temple that Jesus was talking about was his physical body. I'm going to prove it to you. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16, know you not that you're the temple of God. So who, what are you? Say it out loud. So you know you not. You're the temple of God. Do you know that now? Amen. And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Amen. Amen. If any man defi oh, I got something to show you. When Solomon built his temple and had that dedication sermon and that dedication prayer, you remember what happened right after that? Does anybody know that story? What happened right after that? The glory of the Lord just <laughs> filled that house. And that Levi priest had to jump out. It was, it was just, okay, you remember that? Now the Spirit of God. Think of spirit. Think of lungs. When a baby what's the first thing it does? <gasps> That's the Spirit of God in the temple, putting His glory in there and putting His life in there. And everybody, I don't care how lost you are, everybody on the planet knows when a baby is born, that's the first thing you're listening for is. <gasps> that's the glory of the Lord filling the temple. And that happens to every human being lost or saved. Your body's a temple. God made it. 
God made it exactly that way. If any man defile the temple, now what does that mean? Does that mean eating bacon, having cholesterol? Does that mean chewing tobacco? Does that mean taking medicine from Big Pharma? Or what does that mean? How is that defiling the temple? The Bible tells you. The Bible will tell you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now he said, let's see, he said it right here. Look up there. I got a little dot. See that little dot? Temple of God. See that right there? And then he said, temple of God, right here. And then he said, temple of God, right here, right? So three times he said, temple of God, temple of God. So what are you? So I'm setting you up for something. I will always tell you I'm setting you up, and I'm setting you up big time. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not? It's because there's a copyright on the book that made you. God owns the copyright. And God does not give you permission to do, to defile that temple, to alter it. Who built it? Notice that no, when every human being is born, they are born more or less fully formed and no man manipulated the building of that baby during the nine months it was in the womb. It just happened. How? The book did it. The book built every member of that baby's body. Do you see that? Okay? You understand that? It wasn't built by man. It was built, and you can say, well, you know, the mother and the father. But that same book goes all the way back to Adam, and who put it in Adam? It's still God's book. Don't matter how many times it's been passed down, it's still God. In fact, let me show you something. Turn to, turn to, um, turn to Genesis five. I want to show you. I want to show you something in your King James Bible. You believe the King James, don't you? Still, I hadn't chased you off yet, have I? Don't intend to. I intend to make you. I intend to make you look at it and go, "That's the Word of God." Look at Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. Look at the first sentence, the first sentence of that, of that verse, chapter 5, verse 1. What does it say? I want you to find the word gene in that sentence. Generation. This is the book of the genes of Adam. And then Adam took his genes, rolled them up, passed them down to Seth. Seth took them, rolled them up, passed them down to Enos. Enos passed them down to, I can't remember all the names, Mahalalel, Canaan, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, all the way down to Noah. Noah handed it down to Shem, Ham, and Bacon, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. <laughs> it's the same book. You got the same book that God wrote. Because God, God is the one who said in Luke 3 that Adam was the son of God. That's good, isn't it? 2 Corinthians 5. For we know that if our earthly house... Remember what I, I, I kind of rushed to this at the end last night. I was teaching about typology. Buildings. Buildings mean something in the Bible. They're symbols of something. A house. A house. Your body is the house. This is the house of God. The temple is the tabernacle is the house. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with what? Hand, the hands of man is what he means by that. Man did not make man. But let me share something with you. Man is trying to remake man. You believe that? Remake. So, if this, the way it is, is the temple of God because it was not made with hands, what if science produces a human that they themselves built? 
Would God inhabit that house? Answer is no. God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Why did he say that? Why did he say it that way? Because God knew that man would recreate man in a different image. And the moment that man rebuilds the house with his hands, God cannot dwell in it. That's deep stuff, isn't it? You think that's where we're going? You know enough about science and what's going on with technology and genetics. Do you think that that's where it could possibly lead? Absolutely. Know your body. Know your body. Okay? So, uh, verse 2, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. That's our new body. And who's building that? God is. He's, it's not the man's hands. It's God. If so be that, being clothed, we should not be found naked. What's the first thing that God did for Adam and Eve? Clothe them so they're not naked. We're not going to leave this world and be naked in heaven. We don't want that. It's in our nature to be clothed, is it not? God put that in us. And so we, our nature is that we desire not to be naked, but to be clothed upon. And that clothing is that new house covering our soul and our spirit. For, that, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened. Not because of gravity, amen. Gravity is a burden, is it not? The older you get, the heavier it gets. Just carrying the body around is hard, hard work, amen. I've heard you guys go, ugh. I'm getting there sooner or later. We groan being burdened, not for that we'd be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. I like that phrase, swallowed up. You remember when Moses and Aaron turned his rod into a serpent? And Pharaoh said, watch this, boys. And his magicians made their en enchantments and turned their rods into serpents. You know what the King James Bible says? Aaron's rod Swallowed up. Death is swallowed up in victory. That's, that's what you get out of a King James Bible. You get a language that is consistent, that when you start tying these words together, you're going, are these connected? <gasps> when, when the Aaron's rod swallowed up the serpents, when Jonah was swallowed up, when death is swallowed up. It means the same. You're getting pictures of what God is going to do. Death is going to be swallowed up in victory. Amen? Oh, I love it. Now, Revelation 4. Now, now we're going to have fun. If you ain't had fun yet, we're going to have fun. You ready to have fun, boys? Wake up now. Okay, get ready. Get ready. I'm going to call your teacher and have her test you on this. Go for it, Mama. Go for it. Ready? Revelation 4. Get your Bible out and look at it. Mark this down. You're going to love this. God showed me this. I preached this, and I had devils all over me in Kenya. And I went and preached this to the people way out in the middle of nowhere. And they danced because I showed them, those Africans, that the world has, has hated them for years and has made them slaves and has disregarded them. And they have nothing in this world to live for. And I showed them that they are the habitation of God in heaven. And they danced. And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven. And... One sat on the throne. Guess who that is? There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are. The name of the Lord is one. The Lord our God is one Lord. Do you know what the NIV says in this very verse? Someone was sitting on it. Stupidest thing. You know who wrote that? Someone who wants to sit on that throne. And I'm going to show you that. You better know your body. Okay? One sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper at a sardine stone. Uh, study stones in the Bible. 
Jesus is the stone cut without hands in Daniel chapter 2 that crushes the four kingdoms and they fall. Okay? So study stones in the Bible. If a stone is cut without hands, that's God. But if a stone has been chiseled and cut with man's hands, that's the idle shepherd, the Antichrist. Because he was made with man's hands. Are you connecting something? Do you think science is going to have the ability to make a man with his hands? With man's hands? Sure he is. You bet on it. Well, don't bet, but I guarantee you that's where everything's going. Okay? So anyway, uh, verse 4, round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had the face as a man, the fourth beast like a flying eagle. If you go to Ezekiel chapter 1, you're going to see a, it's a different version, but it's the same thing. You ever notice that your right eye and your left eye see a different thing from a different angle, but when they're looking at it together, it's one thing, one image, right? So that's what you get with Old Testament, New Testament. If you compare Ezekiel 1 with Revelation 4, you're going to see subtle differences in those four living creatures. But it's the same as looking at something with this eye and then looking at it with this eye. It's the same image, but from two different angles. One Old Testament and one New Testament, putting it together so you can get the whole picture of what this really is. Isn't that neat? Okay? So, um, the four and... The, uh, the four beasts, verse 8, had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy. Now, why did they say it three times? Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. And then they said, Lord God Almighty. Why did they give him three names? The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. And then they said, which was and is and is to come. Why did they say three different time scales, time frames? Past, present, and future. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. So there's three things here, and they say three things three times, and they do it forever and ever and ever. You, you need to believe in the Godhead. Amen. 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 <laughs> you need to, because the angels do. Yeah. Amen. That's why they say that three times. That's why God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Yeah. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Three. Yeah. Amen. The three buried in he record in heaven. Oh, now look at this. Here's the throne. Look up here. Here's the throne. I want you to notice, it has four chambers. Left atrium, right atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. How many living creatures were holding the throne of God? Four. They were living creatures, and they were four different species, but they were all doing the same thing. They were supporting the throne of God. And that's what the four chambers of the human heart does. Your life is in that heart. And if those four chambers don't do their job, you're dead in 30 seconds or less. Amen? Amen? Your life is in your heart. The Holy Spirit ruleth from our hearts, the Bible says, and is in our hearts. Your heart is the four-chambered throne of God. Somebody say amen. amen. Woo! Now watch this. And immediately I was in the Spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven, one sat on the throne. And then we have, now, oh, I like this, I like this. We had the four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And there was a throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Surrounding the throne, the four-chamber heart, is a sack. What is that sack called? The pericardium. Peri means around. Cardium is Greek for heart. Pericardium means it surrounds the heart, and it's full of water, clear as crystal. When they thrust the spear in Jesus' side, what came out? Blood and They pierced his bloated pericardium that obviously had swelled from him being hanging on that cross, 
and massive amounts of water came gushing out. It was the sea of glass surrounding the throne of God, clear as crystal. You're the temple. You have the throne in you, just like described in heaven. You have that in you. Who is, oh, look at this. 2 Corinthians 1, who has sealed us and given us the earnest of the spirits, where? In our hearts. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshy tables of what? The heart. Watch this. When Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the two tables in his hand, the two tables were written by the finger of God on the front side and on the back side. So he has two tables, and they're written on both sides. How many pages are there? And you have the Word of God written in your four chambers of your heart. <laughs> this, thy Word have I hid in my that I might not sin against thee. See, when the Word is in your heart, it rules you. That's his God sitting on the throne in your heart. Mm. The, who, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. That's the word of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet to give the light of the knowledge. Knowledge. Knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The world is going to be presented with two Jesuses. The real Jesus and another Jesus. God's people who have the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ are going to be able to recognize the real Jesus. The world and the worldly churches are not because the word does not rule and it does not give them the knowledge of the face of God in Jesus Christ. They're going to pick the wrong one, aren't they? Israel was, had that same choice, didn't they? Where did they get Barabbas? Where did they get him from? Was he hanging in a tree somewhere? Was he just... You know what the prison is? The bottomless pit. Where's the beast right now? He's going to be pulled out of prison like Barabbas and set in front of everybody and said, pick one. And they picked the wrong one, didn't they? Know your Bible. Know your body. Know this book. So you'll know Jesus, the real one, not the fake one. Okay? And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. What does your heartbeat sound like? Oh, I know what. I am crazy thunder. What makes it beat? Lightning. Electricity. Where's your voice? It's right here, right close to your heart. Okay? Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings. Just like in your heart proceeds lightnings and thunderings. How do they get the heart to keep going when it stops? <laughs> I'd better be dead unconscious if they ever did that to me. I'll tell you that right now. There's the sea, there's the sea of glass, the pericardium. It's, full, it's a sea surrounding the throne of God, just like the sea of glass surrounding the throne of God. You're the temple, people. You're the te your body's a temple. Every lost person, every lost human being, God made them to be His dwelling place. But you got to invite Him in. You got to ask him in. What does he do? He's not kicked the door down. I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open up, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Seven lamps of fire. Take a look at this. This is called, remember I showed you this. This is the, let's say this is the Old Testament, this is the New Testament. So when you're, uh, Paul said, all scripture is given by, 
the word inspiration has the word spira, and that means breath, like respiration. Okay? Inspiration of God. So when you're reading your Bible, the Holy Ghost is breathing in your soul. It's just like you taking in breath so that your body can live. It's, it's no different than that. How long can you live without food? 40 days. How long can you live without water? Three days. How long can you live without air? Six, seven minutes. Extreme situations where it's, been, it's gone longer. But you can't live very long without inspiration. Read your Bible. Breathe. Okay? And, and read the Old Testament. Because when my, left, when my left lung takes in air, what part of the body does it send it to? It doesn't matter. It goes, it goes everywhere. There's nothing that says, I can't read the Old Testament. I must read only the New Testament. Or I must only read the Old Testament. I can't read. There's nothing in the Bible that says, read the whole Bible. Because he said it was here little and there little. Yeah. Line upon line. Precept upon precept. Right lung, left lung. It doesn't matter. Read that Bible. Amen. Now, that, now that you're kind of getting it, you're going, to read, you're going to read the stories again. Read David and Goliath. Read Samson. Read all these stories in the Bible that are there for your learning and your admonition unto whom the ends of the world are come. Read that Bible. Let God breathe in your soul and let, let it live. Let God breathe in this church. Amen. Amen. Give them Bible verses, preachers. Preach the Word of God. Give them breath. Amen. Amen. Woo! So the air, the Spirit comes from the head, right? We showed that a while ago. Now what this is, I'm going to show you something cool. This is called the brachia. But notice it comes down from the head, branches out into the lungs. This is called the brachial tree. And it's called the brachial tree for a reason. If I look at it like this, that's how it looks in the lungs, coming down from the head. If I turn it upside down, now it looks like a tree. Even the branching out looks like a tree. So when I do this, and I show you that the lamps, the candlestick in heaven, and the one in the tabernacle had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pipes seven branches, and this were almond decorations, so this was an almond tree, is what it was meant to show. And remember, these decorations numbered how many? 66, exactly. Showing you that the light in our bodies must come from the 66 books of the Word of God. That's where the Spirit is. That's where the light is. And if, there's, and if you take these out, you're not going to have the light. Amen? So now here's your brachial tree. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven branches. God built it just like He told them to make the candlestick. Amen. 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 The seven spirits of God are going in you when you breathe. Lost people, when lost people breathe, the seven spirits of God are going in them. Boy, if lost people could get a hold of this. They would see that they're not made from monkeys. God made them out of His own image. Look at that. What do trees do? What do the leaves do? They breathe. We take in oxygen, and our body takes all the stuff in it, burns it in the cells, and takes the ashes, which are carbon, and blows it back out. So we blow out carbon dioxide. The trees love carbon dioxide because they breathe in carbon dioxide, convert it to oxygen so that we can breathe it, convert it back to carbon dioxide so they can breathe it, convert it back to oxygen. I think the breath is meant to be shared. Amen? Start looking at everybody as a tree that needs to breathe a little. These are the, I always have problem, alveolas. They look like little olives on the end of the branches. That's where all the, the respiration process takes place. That's where the oxygen is taken into the blood and then the carbon dioxide is taken out of the blood and blown out through the lungs. And it looks just like olive branches. 
because what is it in, was it Zechariah or Zephaniah? They saw the, the olive branches, the two olive trees. Okay, that were the two witnesses. Hmm. And then in verse 4, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats. Twenty-four seats. And upon the seats I saw twenty, four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. Twenty-four. How many ribs do you have? Twenty-four. And they surround the throne of God. Your ribs start here and they go all the way around and come back all the way around again. And you got 24 of them. You are the temple of God. Fearfully and wonderfully made. God designed your body to be His house. Just like the one He lives in in heaven. So in Deuteronomy, in the tabernacle, he said, take this book of the law. See this? Rolled up like a scroll. Take this book of the law, put it in the inside of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. Thy word have I hid... You see, the Israelites were not ruled by Moses. They were not ruled by the Sanhedrin. They were not ruled by the elders. They were ruled by a book. A book told them what to do every day. A book told them how to build the tabernacle, how to take it down, how to put it back up. It told them how to move, when to move. It told them what to do with themselves. It, told, it gave them laws, and it commanded them. It made them who they were, just like your DNA does. Yeah. And it was put in the... Here, think, of, think of this as the tabernacle. Here's the... i I, I got to show you this yet. But here is the most holy place, and that's where the book was. So let me show you something. In thy book all my members were written. So I jumped ahead on this. What time we got here? We, we into the 1030 yet? No, not yet. All right. In thy book all my members were written, which in continuance of fashion, when as yet there was none of them. Um, who's been saved more than 30 years? Raise your hand. Who's been saved more than 40 years? Raise your hand. 50 years. 60 years. Anybody save 60 years beyond 60 years? Okay. 60 years right at 60. So you were saved, but none of these other rascals were. But God had them written down. Did He not? Yeah. Brother Ellis, you were here. Are any of these people saved because of your work here, either as deacon or pastor? Okay. Okay. Either way. Because God used you with the book in your hand. Because I know you. You don't preach out of your head. You don't preach out of Chuck Colson or anybody else. You preach the Bible. And you give the Bible. And the Bible made new members. Just like in the embryo of a baby, it starts growing arms because the DNA started building arms. And then it started building legs, and it started building t heart tissue first that beat, and then it started adding to that tissue to make a beating heart very early on. It's murder to kill it. It's murder. Okay? It's a disgrace to our country. Okay? So what I'm showing you is just because somebody been saved longer than somebody else, God had this prepared. He saved you exactly when He was ready to make you. Yeah. Not a day before and not a day after. You fellas, do you remember the time when you used to talk like this? <laughs> Believe it or not, I sang in a boys' choir at our local college for a Johann Sebastian Bach cantata that they did for Christmas when I was in sixth grade. I had that high... Castrato voice, and I sing wonderfully that Hallam of God, most holy. 
Okay? I can't hardly do that anymore. The next year I was going, Oh, Lamb of God, most holy. What happened? DNA. DNA said, let's stretch him vocal cords out. DNA said, let's add some hormones to this boy. Start getting hair coming out of his nose. Right, fellas? Right? Just start. See, you didn't have that when you were five. You didn't have it when you were three. But you're getting it now. Why? God was still adding members. They were already written in the book. It just wasn't time yet. So in this book, and by the way, DNA is a book of prophecy. Because everything about you, it has already foretold it. And in one day, it's just all going to happen. Just like this book. And that is so, man, I love this. So in thy book, all my members, that's a member, it's an ugly member, right? But it's useful, right? It's a forklift. <laughs> Amen? Need that. Need that hard skin there. Okay, what about that? That's a member. It's, you don't tell me you don't know what that is. It's your music maker. Right? Okay. Lips, toes, eyes, all members made by the book. Okay. How about this? In thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. David wrote that 3,000 years ago. And it took Watson and Crick years to figure this out back in the 1950s. Okay? And everything we know about DNA is only like 60 years old. And most of what we know about DNA is about 20 years old. And we're learning more every day. And everything that they learn just tells me that it's the book. They, they, learned, they learned how to read the book. They can read your DNA and tell you what parts of the DNA are doing things in your body. Yeah. Now, here's the scary part. Now that they know how to read it, they know how to write it. Yeah. And if they see things that they don't like, they take them out. And if they see that you're missing something, they'll take it from someplace else and put it in you. And they do it very easily. Now, it's called CRISPR. DNA editing. I don't want to get into it, how it works, but right now, see, years, let's say 10 years ago, it cost millions of dollars to try to edit DNA, and it was hit and miss. They could never get it to work, and it just cost too much money. Finally, somebody hit on a method that was done by bacteria, and now, now, how old are you? Yeah, 13. 13. You can buy a kit, and in your room, you can edit DNA of a microbe in your room with the CRISPR gene editing system. That's how easy it is now to edit DNA. They're not going to stop editing human DNA. They're going to keep going. Okay? Know your body, people. Know your body because it's a temple, right? Yeah. So here's what your DNA looks like. It's rolled up, um, packaged in 46 chromosomes. This is what your chromosomes look like. They look like a cross. A cross in your body, in every cell of your body. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Okay? The DNA is in the chromosomes, and there's 46 of them, and they're put in the nucleus of every cell in your body. Think of a cell as the blocks that make a building. Every block is like a cell in your body, and the cells are the blocks that when they're all put together, they make the body what it is. 
We know, here's what we know about DNA. It's rolled in a helix form, twisted, two spines. Here's the spines here, the rungs of the ladder, and they're made of sugar and phosphorus. They're linked together by one, two, three, four compounds, four of them. Remember that number we had a while ago. Remember what? Remember how the, 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 the Word of God, the commandments were written on the two stones, the tablets, front and the back. So there was four pages. You have four, four different compounds that make the letters of DNA. They're bonded together by hydrogen. Okay? These four bases are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Now, I'm not giving you a test on this, but I want you to think of it like this. If this is the book that God wrote, look at how He wrote it. Here's the Old Testament, and here's the New Testament. And what gives us understanding, and what joins the New Testament with the Old Testament, are four books called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that's the four base pairs that link the two sides of the DNA together. Because of the way this is encoded, you could take this half take half of this and put it in a new cell, and the new cell would automatically know how to link the other half back together because adenine only links with thymine and guanine only links with cytosine. So if it's adenine here, it has to be thymine here. And if it's guanine here, it has to be cytosine here. So you can take the book, rightly divide it, And when you, know how, when you know how this is all connected together, when you read the Old Testament, you can see the New Testament in it, can't you? You can see how it connects. When you read the New Testament, now you can see the New Testament in the Old Testament, and you know that Christ is what connected it all together. In fact, in this right here, where these two compounds are joined together, this is what makes the words of the book of DNA. And where did the Word of God show up in our Bibles? In the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> It looks like Morse code. Morse code is nothing more than a dot and a dash. A, you know, dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. What did I just say? SOS. S is dot, 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 dash, dash, dash. That's O and dot, dot, dot. You can do it with light. You can do it with sound. You can do anything. And DNA is encoded just that way. So let's say this is adenine and thymine. This would be a dot. This is guanine and cytosine. This would be a dash. This is guanine and cytosine. This would be a dash. So a dot and a dash and a dash, these three together would make one letter of the, of the word of DNA. You follow me so far? Three more make another letter. So if I have three more, let's say this makes the letter G, this makes the letter O, this makes the letter D. What do I have? God. Now here's the neat part. Is that the, the, the scientists know that DNA is encoded just like a book. So every three of these connections here makes a letter. And they read the letters, and they know that they make words. And then, and they know that these words make the genes that make the parts of our body, like phlegm. Okay? So here's the, here's the, the word for phlegm. This is what makes the phlegm in your body, and they know how to read it because when this is all finished, and it's done coding for phlegm, there's a codon at the end of it. They call it a stop codon. It's a, it's a period at the end of a sentence. God put periods so that the scientists would know where the sentences stop and where a new gene sequence begins. So let's do it like this. When you got saved, a guy didn't sit down and read the whole Bible to you, did he? And say, do you believe all that? No. What he was making was a new convert. He didn't need the whole Bible to do that. He only needed John 3.16, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 1 John 1, 9, John 3.16. That's the verses that we use to lead people to Jesus. And once they're converted, now they're a new member of the body. Now we start giving them discipleship. We start giving them other things in the book and build upon what was begun on that day. That's discipleship 101, people. 
We don't give them the whole Bible. We give them what makes them a Christian. And then after that, we're giving them more and more of the Word of God. And they are growing and building. And new things are coming, things are coming out of them that they never thought possible. And it's all coded in this book. So why would the devil want to change it? Why? me. Oh, by the way, turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Not only, not only does the base pairs in a sequence make the letters that are in the book. When you look at Psalm 119, have you ever noticed Psalm 119 was divided up? You ever notice that? How is it divided up? By what? What letters? Hebrew letters. You know how many there are? In Hebrew there's 22. Do you know how many letters are in DNA that make the proteins in your body? 22. They're called amino acids. There's exactly 22 amino acids that make the letters of DNA and there are 22 letters in Hebrew. This is God's book. And he wrote it in his language. Ooh. Great are thy tender mercies, O Lord, quicken me according to thy judgments. The book is rolled up like a scroll. It's the book of God. When it's rolled up like a scroll, it can't be read. In order for it to be read, you have to unroll the book. Here's the DNA structure itself. I, sh I showed you that. The two rungs and the four base pairs. Think of the Old Testament and the New Testament joined together by the four Gospels. This, these two legs here, watch this now. These two legs here are made of two things, and only two things, phosphorus and sugar. Phosphorus. Tell me what phosphorus does. You dip bullets in phosphorus, what for? Tracers. Tracers. So you can see them at night. They glow. They light. God literally made the book out of light. He literally wrote the book with letters of light. And then sugar. So Psalm 119, how sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. God made this book out of sugar. And when Ezekiel took the rolled up book and ate it, what did it taste like? It was sweet. When John took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, what did it taste like? Sweet. Sugar. They didn't know that. They didn't know this 3,000 years ago. God did. The entrance of thy words giveth light. That's because this, this book is literally made out of light. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So think of the Old Testament. The Old Testament says the ministration of death. That's because the Old Testament is death. If you follow the covenant of the Old Testament, you'll die because you broke the covenant. Okay? Written and graven in stones was glorious. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? So, in the New Testament, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of that light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light. Notice that the word light is capitalized L in this passage here. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four letters written in light. When you preach this book, preachers, you're giving light to your people. And you're giving them sweetness to those people. Mm. I showed you this last night. The book of the generations of Adam. And he was 930 years. The 930th chapter is Matthew chapter 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. It's all perfect. The books have authors. Hebrews 5, 9, being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation and all them that obey him. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith cometh by hearing, hearing by he wrote our faith. He authored our faith. You have faith because God wrote it in his D This book is the DNA of this body. 
Do you understand that? So if a body has a different book, it's a different body, a different author, a different father. Right? Okay, if you look at me and look at Brother Ellis, we're not kin. Okay, his daddy, my daddy, not same daddy. Right? Okay, he's different, I'm different. So in that aspect, we're not kin. And if you compare churches nowadays, now it's becoming more evident. See, when a baby's first born, you can't really tell if it's yours or not. You let it grow for a while. And the daddy's going, hey, my son. Does that happen? Or does that just happen in Missouri? <laughs> I asked him in Kenya. I didn't want to assume they were ignorant, but I asked the interpreter. I said, do the people know about DNA? And he said, DNA? I said, yeah, DNA. And he said, yeah. He said, that's how we figure out who's the daddy. And I went, well, you're just like America. <laughs> By the way, God is not the author of confusion. And the more science reads this book, the more in awe they are. Because they thought initially that it was a jumbled mass. And it would take them forever to figure it out. Then they understood that it was all written in perfect order. Wow. So in thy book, in thy book, all my members were written. Whether they're in Africa, or Europe, or Asia, or Missouri, or Arkansas. All the members were written from the book. God made you who you are from the Bible. Which in continuance was fashioned. There's still people getting saved. When as yet there was none of them. That's the day of Pentecost. There was none of them. Until that day they were conceived. Holy Ghost came in. Light came in. And then all of a sudden now, members are being added to the body. And that's sweet. Was oh, so good. So, here's, here's you. And you've got a King James Bible. Okay? And you've got a buddy. And you're witnessing to him. And you're giving him scriptures. Because he don't know the Bible. You're giving him scriptures because you want him to be saved. So, you're not giving him Rick Warren stuff. You're not reading him the works of Mahatma Gandhi. You're giving him the words of God. You're trying to make a convert. And when you do, when he finally admits it, he believes it, the light comes on. They've actually discovered this. The very second the male seed enters the egg, a light shines. Do you know, turn to John 1. I want to show you that. I want to show you that in your Bible. We having fun? You want to go home and watch MacGyver for a while? Look at verse 9 in John 1. He was, uh, verse 8, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness to that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Look at that. Everybody that's conceived, a light comes on immediately. Amen. The moment they're conceived. And that's, that's in your Bible right there. Amen. So, you want to make a new convert. So, you give them the word... I like what you did, brother. You did what I do. Strangers come our way. If we can give them money, we will. But they're getting a Bible out of us. And they may, whether they read it or not, I'm going to give it to them. Because, and I tell them, read it. I tell them, read John, read all the Psalms, read it. Okay, just read it. God will direct you. God will make something out of you. But what you're doing is exactly what goes on in your body right now. Your body needs more cells. It needs to make more cells. So what it does, it takes this book which is rolled up like a scroll, and it opens it up, okay? And then it rightly divides it. It unzips these base pairs. And because of the rules, this, this part goes into the new cell. 
and this part stays in the old cell. And because of the rules, adenine can only join with thymine. It's just like certain Lego pieces. They, they are a round peg in a round hole and a square peg in a square hole. That's how it works. The new cell knows how to add the other half because of those rules. In Isaiah, he said, Seek ye out the book of the Lord. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. And every time you read the New Testament, you can see that there are parts of the New Testament that are mated to parts of the Old Testament. And once you see that, you never forget it. And that's how it works in the cells. And this is just discipleship 101. Paul writes the book. He teaches the book. They, these people believe it. And then they take what they have received, and then they make other cells. See, the cell that you just made is destined to make another cell. And that cell is destined to make more cells. And it's been working that way ever since. And God was in control of all of it because even though some sow the seed and some water, God always gives the increase. You're worried about how big your church is. That's not your worry. Your, your job is to either sow seed or water the seed. And water is the Word of God. God is the one who decides in each church the parable of the seed and the sower, when the, when the seed fell upon good ground, some 30, some 60, some 100. And who decided if it was 30 or 60 or 100? God took me out of the business of many years ago of worrying about how big my church had to be. God smote me one day, and I repented. And I said, God, I will let you decide that. And... I'll just tell you this. When I'm looking at my church and I see 20 people there on a Sunday night, there's at least 500 more gathered online right then. And probably another thousand there are going to watch that sermon later. And then it's going to be broadcast. God's given us two FM radio stations in Kenya. It's going to be broadcast to over 300,000 people in both of those places. I don't worry anymore about whether somebody's listening or not. God is the one who decides. And I appreciate you guys doing that. Keep doing it. Because everybody is on Facebook. And somebody, somebody is going to see it. And as long as we don't care how they get saved or who gets saved or what God does with them after that, if we just worry about sowing the seed and watering that seed, God will find the good ground and He will bring the increase. Who determines... How many people were born on the ark of Noah? How many people were born on that ark? You mean those couples didn't get together for a whole year? God is the one who decided who was born on the ark. None of them. But after that, God said what? Be fruitful. And then you had the lineage in Genesis 10. Okay? How many children do you have in your family? Who determined that? God did. God is the one who decides it all the time. Let him do it. Amen. You're free, Pastor. God will make you free yeah. from that burden. If you'll just do what he said, he'll take care of the rest. Amen? Well, I tell you, let me, let, I'm going to finish with this. This is about blood, and I'm going to let you go. We're having fun. Amen? No, I want, no, I want to mind the God. I want to mind the Spirit. I've got, I've got to do this. Before we leave out of here, turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians 2. I'm going to give you this, and then if God leads, I'll show you a little bit about white blood cells. Boy, this, this blessed me. God, God showed me this one afternoon, and I just I rolled in glory. But I'm going, to show, I'm going to give you the summation of what I've been pounding in you. Know your body. Know what it is. It is the temple of God. How can it be defiled? God tells you in the Bible. He says it in no uncertain terms. There is a way to defile the temple of God. Now, remember, if I say temple of God, what is that? Is that a building somewhere? Because buildings were built by men. It's your body. So now let's read the Bible. 2 Thessalonians 2, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. Are we ready to be gathered? Boy, I'd like to be gathered. Amen? 
That's the gathering. We're going to be gathered together in Christ in the air. Meet Him in the air. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. There's a shaking coming. God's going to shake the heavens. God's going to shake the earth. And the things that are going to stand when that shaking takes place are the things that remain. The things that God built. But when He shakes, things are going to fall. Because there's a falling away taking place. Is there not? Satan falls, Dagon falls, Babylon falls, Jericho falls, uh, Jezebel fell, right? Look at all these things that fall in the Bible. What happened on the day when Nebuchadnezzar blew all the instruments? What, ha- what did all the people do? They fell before an image that was 60 and 6. What does that tell you? That was the beast. And they fell. But who stood. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They, with, they were able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Okay? God is going to give His people the ability to stand when everybody else falls. So now watch. Be not shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a... What's going to happen first? The gathering or the falling away? You've got to believe the Bible, people. Put your charts away. Put your charts away. Quit reading charts and read your Bible. I'm not here to shake anybody's view of the rapture. I'm here to tell you to read your Bible. And if you tell God you already know something, He'll forget about you and move to somebody that says, God, teach me. So let God teach you. And I quit believing that I was going to be yanked out of here before anything else happened when I read this and I found out that the falling away takes place first. When the, se- when the wheat and the tares are sown, what's gathered first, the wheat or the tares? Tares are, not the wheat. Tares first, then the wheat. There's a, I'm going to teach that tomorrow night. Okay. Anyway, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he is God, sitteth where? Read it out loud. What is the temple of God? It's not a building anywhere, is it? He sits. We've already shown you that in a born-again believer, the Holy Ghost sits on the throne, literally on the the four-chamber heart throne, surrounded by a sea of glass, surrounded by 24 elders, with the seven spirits of God in the two lungs, and the thunderings and the lightnings and the voices. I've already shown you that this is the temple of God, and God is sitting here. And every lost person should have God sitting, should have, this is God, should have God in their heart, ruling out of their heart. But they're not going to. They're going to let another one sit in their four-chamber heart, surrounded by a sea of glass. The man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. See, there's people all over the world that think that God sits in their heart, but He doesn't. They're lost. They're following another God, aren't they? Roman Catholics follow a different Jesus, right? They follow a Jesus that's still dead on the cross and has to die every time they do the Mass. That's not the same Jesus we believe in, is it? See how it's working? They have a different Jesus in here. That's how you defile Turn to 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians 6. God tells you how the temple is defiled. Do what Manasseh did. You'll figure it out. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Amen. See the opposites? When God created the light, He divided the light from the darkness, did He not? And He called the light day and the darkness night. And day is not night, and night is not day. 
They're two separate things. God divided them. God always divides things that are opposite. Up is not down, and down is not up. On is not off, and off is not on. And a believer is not an unbeliever, and an unbeliever is not a believer. Okay? So what, con- what communion hath light with darkness? They don't get along, do they? It's one or the other. Okay? One or the other. But they're not both present at the same time. Um, what concord hath Christ with Belial? That's what Satan was trying to do with Jesus, trying to get him involved in a concord, an agreement. Worship me and I'll give you all these kingdoms. Turn his stones into bread. Fall down, the angels of God pick you up. He was trying to get Jesus into an agreement with him. And there is no agreement between Christ and the devil. None. What concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Infidel is unfaithful. They do not believe. Fidelity, that's what the word fidel means. It's faith. What, well, here it is, verse 16. What agreement hath the temple of God? What is the temple of God? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Turn to Ezekiel 14. Is it possible that the idol shepherd, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, the Antichrist, is it possible that he will rule and reign from the heart of man, literally inside him, telling him what to do? Ezekiel 14. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me, and sat before me, and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, So to man, these men have set up their idols, where? In their heart. And listen to me. You may not have a statue of Jesus or Mary in your house. You may not have a little garden with Mary sitting out there going. But it's very possible you could have an idol of an image of God that does not match the Bible in your heart. That's where nobody can see it. See, when you carve out an image of God that does not match this book, you have made God in the image that you wanted Him in. And that God is the one that's in your heart. That's an idol in your heart. See how that works now? How many people sitting in churches all over this country have carved out a different God than the one that's in this Bible? They keep their sin, and yet God lets them do it. That's not the same God. God God will take a son and drive sin out of him with a rod. But the guys and the gals sitting in churches where God lets them keep their sins... And keep their filthy habits. That's a different God. And they've got that in their heart. And look at what God said. Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired at all by them? Should I listen to them? Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I the Lord will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. If you got idols, do you, do you not wonder why some of these people that are going to these coffee shop churches with the wild music and almost no Bible, or they're using four different translations, why you cannot talk to them about the Word of God and about right ways for worshiping God? You ever wondered that? Why they won't listen? God talks to them based upon the idols that they have in their heart. And if that's the idol, if that's the God they want to worship, that's the God that God lets them worship. Because they put the idol there. Nobody else did. There's a church in our county, 10 miles from our church. The music leader is a known sodomite. Baptist church. Known sodomite. His wife divorced him because she found out he was queer. And her and her boyfriend sit in that church, and him and his boyfriend sit in that church, and he leads the choir because he's good at it. Why is that going on? How can they have church and have that going on? They've carved out a different God. 
and God will speak to them according to that idol in their heart. He not tell them the truth. They don't have the truth and they never will. That's scary. That's where we're going. Amen? Know your body. Know who you are. Know what you are. You're fearfully and wonderfully made by God. He made you to be His temple. He wrote your book. And He says, and I'm going to close with this. He says at the very end of the book, Revelation 22, He put at the end of the contract... Just like in any contract you write up with somebody, there's always a clause, a statement in there that says, nothing added to this contract, nothing can be added to this contract unless agreed by both parties. So if, you've, if your contract has four pages, they have you initial all four pages, that way you know you had four pages of the contract, that way the guy can't shuffle in a fifth page and add stuff to it and say, well, this was the contract. No, it wasn't. I didn't agree to that fifth page. Yeah. Or take page three out. And you say, well, where's page three? Well, that wasn't there. Oh, yes, it was. See the numbers? One, two, four. There's something missing. Right? Okay? And you're going, you're trying to get something over on me, and I'm going to take you to court, and I'm going to win. Because courts go by what is written, and so will God. So he says at the end of the contract, at the end of the book, Verse 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. The two rules are, if God wrote the book, you cannot add, you cannot take away from it. If you do, my contract with you is null and void. Know your body. Amen? Know what's going on. Know what your insurance company is trying to put. In, listen to me. Ten years. In ten years' time, you listen to me. Your insurance company is going to say to you, we have your DNA sample. We have found the probability of you getting this disease. It hadn't shown up yet, but it's there. You allow us to augment your DNA we will cover the, the charges and we will continue to cover your health care. If not, we will cancel you. Because we gave you the chance to get healed and you didn't take it. So that no man might buy or sell save he had the mark. Okay? They're going to force mankind to have his DNA rewritten. Don't do it. You stick with the King James, right? If I come in here with the Book of Mormon and start preaching out of it, what are you going to do to me? Oh, come on, you're carrying guns. I know better. Okay? I know what you're going to do. Shoot first, ask, tell God, ask God later about it. We can't add to the book. We can't take away. And this is the book that God wrote. Don't let anybody add to it. I'd rather die with God's book intact. And you see, in the book of Revelation, they loved not their life even to the death. And they were killed, beheaded, because of the testimony that they held. And this is the testimony. This testifies that God wrote this book. And they'll behead you for it. I'd rather that than to add or take away and have my part in the lake of fire. Father in heaven, this book, I love this book. God, I love this book. I love doing this. I love teaching these people. Thank you, God, for this church. I love this church. These people, Lord, they want to listen. They want to hear it. They believe it. And I thank you, God, for opening up our eyes to these wondrous things. God, when I think of what is man, that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visitest him. For you made us a little lower than the angels. And yet you're going to crown us with glory, and you're going to have us governing and ruling angels. God, what are we that you are mindful of us? What are we, God, that you built us to be your habitation? God, we're wicked, we're sinful, we're undone, we're unclean, we're weak, God. And yet you built us, Lord, to be your holy habitation. 
God, I'll never get over that as long as I live. And for all of eternity, Lord, I'll worship you and praise you, God, for making me your house. And Father, I pray, God, that you'd bless these people. Give them knowledge. Give them understanding, God. Give them wisdom. Help them to know the book. Help them to know the body. And Lord, teach us. Lord, prepare us tomorrow night, Lord, to know our enemy. To know how our enemy works. Know his tactics. Know how he does things. God, just open the, open the eyes of this church, God. It doesn't matter, Lord, if there's only 20, 25 people here, 30 people here. God, these are the ones you brought here. These are the ones you wanted here. You didn't want any more than what's here tonight. And I thank you for that, God. I pray, dear God, that out of this, Father, out of what was small, just like that little tiny book of DNA, out of what was small, God, you can make things big. Thank you, God, Lord, for sharing this with us tonight, for being our God and for being our teacher and our Father. We love you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you. I love you. Good to preach to you.